Okay. Yeah. Okay, Katie. So it looks like. Katie, so it looks like um, hey, the live feed is working too. So if that if this dies, you can follow that YouTube link I sent you. Okay. Okay. Cool. Welcome back to the party. Are we? Are we? So many laptops. <laughs> hey, Katie. Muted her so you can't hear her say hi. <laughs> <laughs> it is nice to be like, honestly, Susan. Thanks for coming. It's not you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, uh, I kind of. You're expected to be here. Oh, yeah. Also, this one is backwards. I know. <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. Hi. I'm glad you're here. Well, I'm glad when I was here. Yeah, it's a good thing. Yeah, like, it's yeah, weird. To yeah. Just read it. Right. She's got to talk to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just, they set up their laptop facing in the air. Yeah. Um, no, I'll just. I think I'll read it. I'll suggest you want to. Yeah. And they'll still want to stop. Yeah. Scott on one of these, don't you? Is that on one of those? Scott? Oh, there's just the YouTube channel. I don't know. This is the YouTube channel. That's her committee member. Yeah, Scott. No, it's a woman. Oh, it's another one? Yeah. Oh, wow. Who's. Yeah, we'll be here. You get Scott to come? Yeah, we'll be here. Yeah, not that dedicated. But if you like, I'm losing you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How'd you set that up? Um, she set it up. I just had to hit play. Yeah, it's my computer. Yeah, I know. It's really nervous. I just like be saying snide comments. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like I should probably not tell them. Nice. <laughs> I can occasionally just like. Good. How are you? Yeah, yeah, of course I can. Hi, Diego. Hey, what's up? You look so old. I've been here for a few years. LinkedIn's a 
Okay. Hey, Sarah. <laughs> 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 Okay, I think we have a quorum. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, for those of you who don't know, my name is David Unstead. I'm with the Department of Pediatrics in the IB Division. And I really appreciate everybody coming to hear the defense uh, that will be given by Elizabeth Um Just a couple of introductory comments about Elizabeth before we get to um, what she wants to present to you today. So um, it'll definitely be you know, a change in the lab when Elizabeth moves on to what she's doing next. She's going to do postdoc in North Carolina. And, you know, um, Elizabeth brings to the lab um, a lot of things. So she she brings a sort of a wry wit. <laughs> and she brings, you know, a good critical eye um, when other people in the group are presenting you know, what they're working on and things like that. Um, and then she, she brings us treats. So, <laughs> you know, we will miss you a lot. And we will miss all the delicious things that you make. So, if you read Elizabeth's CV, you know how at the bottom there's that section that's like hobbies and interests and the fluffy stuff? So, under there, one of the, one of the line items is Baker Extraordinaire. <laughs> and in fact, speaking on behalf of the lab, I can say that's definitely true. So, you know, we are just, we've gotten very accustomed to when's the next birthday or the next celebration because then Elizabeth will bring something and bring something for us to eat. And she has made over the last few years, in addition to progress on the scientific front, a number of delicious cakes, cupcakes, <laughs> muffins, scones, you name it. We've all had to go run extra miles because we've had it as well in our group. <laughs> Uh, and so um, this is one of the things that, that is Elizabeth's passion, and we have been the beneficiaries of it for a long time, and so um, that we will uh, miss as well. Um, I just So that's what we like by Elizabeth. Uh, <laughs> and I want to tell you uh, about a couple things that Elizabeth likes. So she, um, she likes Louisiana, I would say. She likes sports, so she, you know, plays a lot of things, soccer, softball, whatever. She she likes she likes beer. <laughs> um, a fair bit, actually. Um, she's, she's become a connoisseur and, and I think probably later tonight there'll be some beer, both in house and wherever the plan is later. Uh, and she's also really um, I think I mean, she was on a good show. She has really <laughs> enjoyed her time with us. Um, she has worked on a couple of different things in the lab. Um, uh, she's going to tell you about two of these things today. Um, one is on the host side of the host pathogen interaction that we study uh, in the lab, and that is studied by many other people in the room. And then um, a project on the bacterial side. Um, and um, so you're going to hear about those things today. In addition to the science, I really want to point out that Elizabeth is an example of where DBS here at graduate school, I think, um, has been saying it wants to go. So there's more to a PhD uh, for someone like Elizabeth than the science. The science is good, and she's done all this other stuff um, that a lot of the students don't take advantage of or, or tackle the way that she does. So Elizabeth's uh, love for teaching has really influenced uh, the way that she has spent her time outside of the lab. Um, so extra TA shifts, a teaching certification from uh, from WashU, uh, the summer focus program as part of the YSP. Um, she really has just done all of these different things, and that's really paved the way for what she's going to do next. 
um, on the UNC uh, on the way to her future uh, science teaching career. So with those comments, uh, thank you all again for coming. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction, David. I think that was pretty spot on. I wasn't where you're going with that, but <laughs> I do like beer and baking and sports. It's usually too. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty much it's all that or? Yeah. <laughs> um, so as David mentioned, I'm going to sort of tackle sort of two sides of the project today. One from the host perspective and another mostly from the lecturer perspective with a little bit of a snippet of another project sort of in the middle. So the title of this project is Defining the Roles of Outer Membrane Proteins in Host, Cathocyte, and Neuropathogenic Control on Infections. For those of you that aren't familiar, in the Hunstead lab, we study host pathogen interactions, and we do this in the context of the urinary tract. And I know that you all remember your high school anatomy, but I'm going to briefly cover um, the actual components of the urinary tract. And in mammals, this is two kidneys, shown here, the kidney bean shaped structures, two ureters, a urinary bladder, <laughs> and the urethra. <laughs> okay, so um, the function of the kidneys is to filter blood. <laughs> they remove waste from the blood and they also balance fluids and electrolytes within the body. That creates urine that travels down the ureters and is stored in the urinary bladder until it's expelled through the body through the urethra. Um, infections of the urinary tract are actually very common. Um, the most common infection is of the bladder itself, and we call this cystitis. But occasionally, patients will develop a more serious invasive disease where the bacteria can ascend up the ureters to the kidneys, and this causes pyelonephritis. We know that this is a serious healthcare burden because uh, nearly 8 million people are infected by UTIs annually, and the majority of these are premenopausal women. And of the women that have an infection, Get worse. <laughs> 25 to 40 percent will have a recurrence within six months. Overall, this accounts for nearly four billion dollars in associated healthcare costs annually in the U.S. And that's due to close to 10 million physician visits and also millions of different antibiotic prescriptions that are um, given to patients to help clear these infections. The vast majority of these infections are caused by E. coli strains. So, depending on the study, you'll find anywhere from 70 to about 85 percent. Of these um, community acquired UTIs are caused by neuropathogenic E. coli or UPEC. And so, because of this, we've been um, over the past couple decades, a really awesome clinical, preclinical model has been established for studying these infections. We use this model to help us understand important mechanisms that are involved in um, the course of infection, and we can also use this to help us inform the design of new therapeutics. This is a mouse-based model. We know that mice are a really excellent model for host pathogen interactions because a lot of the aspects of human disease are replicated in the um, mirroring model. For this specific model, we um, anesthetize our mouse. We can then create a catheter with very thin tubing that's on the end of the needle, and you can actually catheterize the mouse. And you can deliver a small inoculum to the bladder of the mouse and withdraw that catheter, and the inoculum will actually stay in the bladder. And so then you can allow the infection to develop for anywhere from one hour to two weeks. And so these are the, I'm going to talk about time points between those two, between an hour after two weeks. At, a, at our determined time point, we can harvest the bladder and kidneys using sterile technique, and then we can homogenize those tissues and serial dilute them to determine the bacterial titer or burden in each of those organs. We can also utilize either the whole tissue or these tissue homogenates for some downstream analyses that include. Um, examining cytokine expression in these tissues, looking at immune cell recruitment, and a variety of other things. And this model allows us to interrogate things both from the host side and also from the bacterial side. Because this model has been used for a couple decades, the bacterial infection cascade is very well characterized. Um, this all begins when a bacteria invades the lumen of the bladder. Bacteria is shown here in blue. Bacterium first binds to these large superficial facet cells. These are epithelial cells that line the lumen of the bladder. The bacteria do this by specifically adhering to the epithelial cells using these adhesive organelles known as type 1 pili, and they can interact with monosylated proteins on the surfaces of these host cells that are called uroplatins. Once this interaction occurs, um, some active remodeling will cause the bacteria to be taken up into the host cells inside a um, membrane enclosed vacuole. From there, the bacteria need to escape out of the vacuole into the cytoplasm. 
um, or else they risk the bacteria refusing with the membrane and releasing the bacterium back into the lumen. Good work. <laughs> um, the bacteria that are in the lumen or in the cytoplasm of the cell are protected from the innate immune system, from antibiotics, and also from just the mechanical shear force of urine that can wash the bacteria out of the water. And in this protected niche, they actually begin to grow and replicate very quickly, and they'll form what we call intracellular bacterial communities. This is shown here, bacteria are staying green. And these are large, dense communities that can contain up to 10 to the fifth bacterium, bacteria, and they have properties of biofilms. At some point, there may be a signal we are not yet sure. These bacteria can slow their division and create these long filaments, and the filaments and the other bacteria will actually flux out of the host cell, and then they can go on to infect neighboring cells. One way that the host itself can get rid of the infection is to shed the epithelial cells in the urine, so these cells can detach from the underlying um, western vitreous shells and cells and be shed. And you can actually detect epithelial cells that contain these large IBCs in the urine of patients that have um, urinary tract infections. Um, David and I both mentioned that I'm going to focus on a host protein, and the first protein that I'm going to focus on is a protein that's involved in the innate immune system. This is an antimicrobial peptide. Antimicrobial peptides are small structures. They're generally 12 to 100 amino acids long. They're produced by all forms of life, from bacteria up to vertebrates. Bacteria produce um, structures called bacteriosins. Insects were the first place that these um, peptides are actually identified, so moths create something called zipropins. Honeybees um, produce melatonin, but then in vertebrates, there's a wide variety of these antimicrobial peptides that are produced. The vast majority of these peptides have been shown to be effective against gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria, against viruses and fungi, and even some cancerous cells. And as depicted on the right here, these peptides can take a variety of structures, and um, somewhat due to these structures, they can have diverse mechanisms of action as well. I'm going to focus on the um, vertebrate peptides, caplocytins. Caplocytins as a group share this full mm -hmm. exon three intron structure that results in um, a pre-pro peptide. This pre-pro peptide has three different, three different domains, a single domain, a capital domain, and a mature peptide domain. The majority of the homology of the caplocytin proteins is found in this capital domain is indicated here with the asterisk. This pre-pro-peptide is cleaved once intracellularly, and then these last two domains are secreted from the cell where they can be cleaved a second time, and the mature peptide will be formed from this last domain here. Caplocytes take on this alpha helical structure um, uh, in the host milieu. And what's interesting about these uh, peptides is that mature peptides have uh, very widely ranging sequences. So on the bottom here, I've aligned the sequences of the mature peptide from a few different animals, and you can see that, well, the, the residues that are homologous to LL30, to the human caplocyte and LL37 are depicted in red, and you can see that there's a lot of variation between even mice, rabbits, and rats compared to humans. We know that this peptide is also active against a wide variety of um, bacteria, so this is from a recent review where they uh, just went through the literature and examined and collected all of the different strains that have been examined for caplocytin susceptibility. So as you can see, there's a variety of gram-negative, gram-positive, and gram-indeterminate um, bacteria represented here. And there are also some of the major UTI-causing strains here. So we see E. coli, we see Klebsiella pneumoniae, we see Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and also Rubistra. And these are some of the most um, highly represented bacteria that cause UTIs. We also know that in the urinary tract, um, caplocytin is expressed constitutively by epithelial cells, and it's also expressed by neutrophils. We know that when a microbe or a potential pathogen invades the urinary tract, the epithelial cells can detect this pathogen and can upregulate the expression of caplocytin. This upregulation will help recruit more neutrophils to the area, which will also increase expression of caplocytin, and it's then thought that this increased caplocytin concentration will help to kill the bacteria. This is supported by some clinical studies that have shown that patients with UTI, shown here, have a higher concentration of LL37 in their urines than patients that have recovered from UTI. And in these sorts of figures, all of these individual points will represent a single sample, so a single patient or a single mouse, as um, I have in a bunch of my um, figures. 
Furthermore, um, other groups have shown that the more invasive uh, diseases are, such as acute pyelonephritis, are caused by strains that are more resistant to um, the killing effects of capsaicin. So it takes more of the peptide to actually kill these more invasive strains. And so knowing all of this, our question became, how does capsaicin expression in the urinary tract affect effect pathogenesis? And based on that data, we hypothesized, of course, that capsaicin would help limit UPEC infection in the urinary tract, and that there could be potentially a variety of mechanisms that are involved in this. The first thing that we did was actually check that our prototypical cystitis isolate, which we call UT89, is actually susceptible to killing by our capsaicin in vitro. And what you see here is that as bacteria are treated with high, with increasing concentrations of cramp, you see lower survival of the bacteria. So indeed, our peptide is effective against the bacteria. We were then given a pair, a breeding pair of mice from Richard Gallo's lab in California, and so I could throw out my own colony of cramp deficient mice um, to use in downstream experiments. One of the first things we wanted to do was to compare our cramp deficient mice to a wild type strain. And that wild type strain is C57 black 6 mice. What you see overall, looking at the structure of the bladder, this is a cross section of the bladder here, and these are closer views, is that the structure is very similar between the two strains of mice. And importantly, you can see that these large epithelial cells that line the lumen of the bladder are present in both strains of mice. We were also interested in quantifying the immune status of the bladder pre-infection in both strains of mice. We looked at cytokines specifically using the 23plex array that allows us to examine the expression of 23 different cytokines. I'm only showing you six here for simplicity's sake. But we didn't find any differences in cytokine expression between our two strains of mice. We can also quantify myeloperoxidase expression, um, which is in, an enzyme expressed by neutrophils, and we can use this as a proxy to determine approximately how many neutrophils are present in the tissue. We don't find any significant differences between our two strains of mice. Um, lastly, I also wanted to make sure that uroflakins um, are present in both strains of mice. So I told you earlier that these specific proteins are important for the bacteria to find and then fade into the host of epithelial cells. And if we quantify expression via immunoglob, we can see that it's similar between our two strains of mice. And furthermore, if we do some immunofluorescence microscopy, here the um, uh, uroplakin is recognized by a secondary with a green fluorescent tag. Um, we see that the proteins are both localized to the urethelium that lines the bladder. So these are correctly expressed as well. Okay, so from there we were um, ready to start our infection with our two strains of mice. Um, again, each individual dot represents a single mouse. And so what you'll see right away is that we find significant differences at all of the time points that we examined, from one hour to 48 hours post-infection. And that was great. And then we realized that this was totally the opposite of what we were expecting. We had actually thought that our cramp deficient mice would be more susceptible to infection, meaning that they would have higher titers in the bladder um, uh, due to the susceptibility. However, we find that as early as one hour post-infection, the cramp deficient mice have lower titers. C57 black 6 mice generally don't, in, um, don't develop chronic infections, but we wanted to check along a later time point. So we looked at two week post-infection just to see if there is any difference in chronic infection and there is not between our two strains of mice. So this is exciting. This is something to work off of. Um, the first thing that we wanted to do was quantify how well our bacteria progress through the IBC cascade. Um, so we uh, examine IBC formation in our two strains of mice using uh, mice that have been infected with GFP containing bacteria. We can examine both early and we can find both early and mature IBCs in the bladders of these mice. So early IBCs are depicted here. These are smaller collections of bacteria more loosely associated. And you can also find these mature IBCs that are taking up almost the entire cytoplasm of the bacteria of the host cells. And then due to these pictures and similar pictures, we wondered if there is a size difference in the IBCs um, that are formed in our cramp deficient mice. So I quantified the volumes of IBCs in the bladders of mice, and while I find um, that the overall size varies between both strains of mice, I don't find a significant difference between the two. I will point out, though, that when I did this experiment, I took Z stacks of all of the IBCs that I found in about three mice for each strain. And one thing that you'll notice is that there's a lot of there's a difference in the number of IBCs that I found. And so we can quantify that using 
by taking advantage of the lax E expression of the um, UT 89 strain, and we can do an in, beach, an in situ stain in the bladder to count the number of IBCs. And what I find is that the cramp deficient mice have almost a log, a log fewer IBCs present in their bladder, and this is at 16 hours post infection. So we know that fewer of these structures are being formed, and that this likely accounts for the differences in titers at 16 hours and later time points. However, we have differences as early as one hour post infection. So we are interested in trying to determine what could be causing that. We started off by looking at um, some in vivo gentamicin protection assays, which allow us to quantify the luminal and intracellular bacteria. And what we find is that cramp deficient mice have fewer bacteria both in the lumen of the bladder and within the cells that are lining the lumen of the bladder. We were curious where these bacteria went because the same number went into the bugs an hour before. So I thought that perhaps these bacteria are being lost in the urine, and indeed when you quantify bacterial titers in the urine, you find that cramp um, mice have more bacteria in, in the urine. This is likely due to an issue with binding um, the host cells. We know that uroplakins aren't involved. We were, we were curious if there was a direct effect on the bacteria themselves and if mycophilic expression was changed. However, if we quantify PLI expression by TEM um, with untreated and cramp treated bacteria, we don't see any differences in PLI expression either. So we know that um, although there is a difference at one hour post infection, it's likely not due to the bacteria and it's probably due to the change in the post epithelium. If we move on and look at um, bacteria that have been infected for six hours, we um, notice a couple of differences in the bladders. So here again are the cross sections of the bladders. The white, which you see, actually represents edema or swelling in the bladder. And you see that there's a lot in the wild type mice and that there's also some in the cramp deficient mice, although maybe not as much. We can have <coughs> detect active infection in the lumen of the bladder of both of these strains of mice. So you can see purple, so these light purple are the bacteria, the darker pink are the epithelial cells that are starting to be shed, and then um, you may be able to see that there are some small, darker staining cells, and those are actually the neutrophils that are responding to infection. So even though there's active infection, we do see some differences. And we can actually quantify that, or the immune response to this, um, again by doing our 23 flex cytokine array. We find that 16 of our 23 cytokines are upregulated in the C57 black six wild type mice, but not in the cramp deficient mice. And furthermore, we have um, a greater neutrophil infiltrate in the wild type mice compared to the deficient mice. At 24 hours post-infection, we noticed a number of differences in the bladders when we examined them by histology. The most striking difference is that while there's still edema in the bladders of the black six mice, the cramp deficient mice seem to have almost fully recovered from the infection. You see very little edema. You can also notice that these large epithelial cells um, that should line the bladder aren't present in the black six mice, except this one that has an IBC in it. But in the cramp deficient mice, you see that there's a lot of these large epithelial cells. Again, the epithelium seems to have recovered by 24 hours post infection. And so to actually quantify these differences in exfoliation, I um, used, I created an immunoblot assay that would allow me to quantify this. <coughs> and what you see here is that even though um, exfoliation is similar early in infection, the cramp deficient mice are able to restore their epithelium by 48 hours post infection, while the C57 black six remain exfoliated and have not yet recovered. Um, together, all of this data gives us a few different conclusions. We know that the cramp deficient mice develop less severe um, acute UTIs. We know that the infection pathway that the bacteria used to cause an infection is not disrupted, but the infections are cleared more quickly and they cause less inflammation. We think that the epithelium of the cramp deficient mice can recover more quickly from infection um, as compared to wild type mice. So when we consider all of this, we think that cramp is actually playing less of an antimicrobial role in the urinary tract. It is actually more important for epithelial maintenance and for immune response to infection. So I have this slide labeled as cramp impact on the host. So I'm going to take a few slides to actually look at what the effects of cramp are on the bacteria itself. Um, one of the first things we did when we were thinking about how we would compare this is to think about comparing a UPET strain to a non-pathogenic strain. So here we have, again, our cystitis isolate UTI-89, as well as a non-pathogenic lab-adapted strain called MG1655. 
if we again put this in our cramp resist our cramp susceptibility um, model, we see that both of these strains are susceptible to the killing effects of cramp, but at higher concentrations, such as 20 micrograms per mil and 50 micrograms per mil, the line actually fares better than the non pathogenic strain. We are interested in examining the global responses to um, cramp in both of these strains of bacteria. So I um, grew up my bacteria in a low salt medium to sort of mimic what's going on in the urinary tract. These cultures were first grown to stationary phase, then back diluted and grown to mid log phase before they were treated with cramp um, and then plated to determine survival. And when I did that, I found a couple of interesting things. So, um, UT89 that have been treated with only one microgram per mil of cramp um, actually grow a little bit after this one hour dose, while the non pathogenic strain is killed by the, the one in the five microgram per mil treatment. And we do see some killing um, at five micrograms with UT89. And again, we are curious to quantify the, to examine the global changes that happen in these cells. So we prepared RNA from untreated one microgram per mil treated um, UT89 and ND1655 cells. And then also we prepared a sample of three microgram per mil um, UT89 cells. And this was so that we could minimize some of the cell death that occurs in our culture, but would also act as a positive control. And our RNA samples were then submitted to the Genome Technology Access Center for RNA Sequencing. And we got some interesting results from that. So um, when these bacteria, when UT89 is treated with one microgram per mole, we find that there's only 12 genes that are differentially regulated in response to this treatment. Whereas at the higher dose, we have almost 1,000 genes that are differentially regulated. Um, in contrast, our non-pathogenic strain doesn't significantly differentially regulate any genes of the one microgram per mole dose. We, this 12, uh, these 12 genes are a manageable number that we can follow up on, and so we're interested to look at what these genes are and to think about what we can um, explore in the future. And some pretty interesting things come out here. So these 12 genes sort of divide into two or three groups. Um, the first is shown in purple, and these are transporters. The second is shown in blue, and these are genes that are involved in metabolism. And the last gene is um, a hypothetical protein, so shown in green. What's most interesting is that three of our five transporter genes are um, identified as dipeptide or oligopeptide transporters. And so these are genes that are specifically involved in bringing um, peptides like cramp into the bacterial cell. And then within the genes um, that are involved in metabolism, most of these are intermediary metabolism, but this gene, um, YFEG, is identified as another protein called RNA in NG1655. And this specific protein has been shown to modify lipid A to increase polymyxin B resistance in vitro. And so polymyxin B is another cationic antimicrobial peptide similar to cramp. And so we think that this could be a mechanism by which the bacteria are potentially um, helping themselves to resist the potential killing effects of this peptide. We're interested in following up on a number of these. And so the first thing I did was to just was to um, make single gene deletions of these 12 genes, and then we can examine the growth in vitro, and we don't find that any of these mutants um, have growth defects. And this is all that I'm going to tell you today. So we identified some cool genes. They don't, grow, they don't have any disruptions in growth, but we have a lot of interesting things that we can follow up on downstream. So as I mentioned, UPEC and not pathogenic, or, and not non-pathogenic E. coli are able to upregulate a defined set of genes in response to this low dose of cramp. Um, I forgot to mention that all of the genes that are upregulated at the low dose are also upregulated at the higher dose. And we find that these genes represent a lot of oligopeptide transporters and then also intermediary metabolism genes, and that our single gene use do not affect growth in rich media. So we think that cramp, again, is having less of an antimicrobial role in the urinary tract, and that UPEC might actually be able to utilize this um, peptide as a nutrient source. And uh, this idea has actually been presented before. So another group has actually shown that um, two of the specific peptide transporters that I found to be upregulated are upregulated when you grow these bacteria in human urine. And they also, in a variety of other genes too. And so they have also come to the same conclusion that bacteria can be using peptides specifically in the urine to increase their growth. Overall, for this cramp story, we have a few different remaining questions. Um, for the, on the host side, I have what I've been calling for a couple of years my chicken and egg dilemma. Um, 
we're not sure if the cramp deficient mice have a less severe immune response because they have a lower infection, or if they have lower bladder titers because they don't have a really strong immune response that's causing a lot of damage in the bladder and allowing the bacteria to access other points and drive this infection. So we have some ideas about how we can follow up on those ideas in the future. And then from the bacterial side, we're curious if cramp can actually use, if bacteria can actually use cramp as a signal, or if they can use it as a carbon or amino acid source in the urinary tract, and how the expression of this peptide can affect pathogenesis. So that's the story from the host perspective. We are also um, interested in the Hunstead lab and outer membrane proteins. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with the gram-negative outer membrane, gram-negative bacteria actually have two lipid bilayers, so shown here. These lipid bilayers are known as the inner membrane and the outer membrane, and between them is the periplasmic space. I have been focusing on a single outer membrane protein known as AMBE, outer membrane protein A, and this is a 35 kilodalton transmembrane protein. The internal domain is shown here, and it forms eight antiparallel beta sheets depicted in blue that result in four extracellular loops shown here in gray. And these extracellular loops are anywhere from 8 to about 17 amino acids long. The C-terminal domain is not shown here, but it's a peri periplasmic globular domain that's thought to bind to the glycan. What's interesting about AMBE is that it's very highly conserved among both E. coli and gram negative bacteria, including um, Klebsiella and Shigella and also Enterobacter. And it's actually one of the most prevalent proteins that's expressed in the outer membrane of E. coli. <laughs> yes. Um, because I think of the high sequence conservation and the prevalence, there have been a number of studies that have looked at this protein. And so it's been described to function in biofilm formation, in immune evasion, in conjugation, and as an adhesion, among other things. At the same time, this protein can also have what I might call detrimental roles for the bacteria. And that can be an immune target or can function as a pathogen associated molecular pattern. And that some of these loops can specifically bind bacteriophages and bacteriosins, which can cause death, which can kill um, the bacteria. Um, knowing all of these roles in our UTEC background, we were interested in whether or not UTEC expression in the uh, was ex UTEC expression was important for virulence in the urinary tract. Based on some previous data, we hypothesized that AMPE was actually directly interacting with some host factors to promote UPEC virulence. Um, so if we start by uh, doing some infections in C57 black 6 mice using our wild type UTI 89 strain and our AMPE mutant strain, you see that at 24 hours post infection, the AMPE mutant has significantly fewer bacteria in the bladders of these mice. So whereas uh, UTI 89 increases the number up to 24 hours before it's slowly cleared, the AMBE uh, mutant strain doesn't have that strong increase and is cleared faster. When we were thinking about how the bacteria could be interacting with the host and what could be mediating this effect, one of the first things we thought about was these extracellular loops. So this is a little different view, but again, you have the A transmembrane domains and the four loops. And for simplicity today, I'm just going to tell you about two of the loops. Um, loop one is the most internal loop, and loop two is the next loop down. Kind of. And so, to study these, we created some mutants in these loops just by um, replacing the majority of this external portion with a one to two amino acid loop that connects the transmembrane domains. We did this for both loop one and loop two. We can then express these uh, proteins with the loop mutants on a low copy number plasmid. Um, and we can use that plasmid to complement the AMBE mutant so that we are then creating bacteria that are expressing a single loop mutant. And what you see here is by immunoblad, uh, both of these strains, both the loop one knockout and the loop two knockout, express AMPE, or this, these smaller AMPE mutants at similar levels to that of the wild type bacteria. We also find that this protein is expressed in the outer membrane of the cells when we do cell fractionation. So we think that this protein is expressed at equivalent levels and is also localized correctly to the outer membrane. If we examine the growth of these bacteria, we find that um, the loop mutants have a little bit slower growth. This is likely due to the addition of form phenocol in the media for plasmid maintenance, though, because the empty plasmid PACYC actually also has um, limited growth. 
We were also interested in determining if the membrane permeability was affected by the expression of these proteins. And to do this, we can examine the uh, susceptibility of these strains, novobiocin. Novobiocin is, a, is an antibiotic that normally cannot penetrate the membranes of gram-negative bacteria. And so if there's a, um, if the outer membrane is disrupted, you'll see an increase in susceptibility, as demonstrated here by the mutant sir a which is deficient in a number of outer membrane proteins. What you see, though, is that each 89 are on bay mutant, and our two new mutants are not disrupted in terms of membrane permeability. So we are confident moving forward in using these strains in infection. And what we found was that when we infect mice with the loop one knockout, we see titers that are higher than that than those found in on bay infected mice, most similar to the wild type strain. And when we infect mice with um, bacterial strain that expresses the loop two knockout, we recover titers most similar to that of on bay. So we have a strain that basically recapitulates the wild type phenotype and also a strain that recapitulates the um, on bay phenotype. We look at IBC expression in these strains. We again see that um, UT89 and the loop one knockout are able to form IBCs as we expected. The Ombe mutant can actually form IBCs. Uh, this strain loses the GFP plasmid every time, though. For some reason, we're not sure why. And so you can you have to identify these um, structures by DNA stain alone. However, we I couldn't identify any IBCs by confocal microscopy. You'll see that there's just a few extracellular bacteria present in these patients here. If we go on to quantify um, the numbers of IBCs in the waters at 16 hours post-infection, we see that actually both Ombe and the Leaf one knockout have lower numbers of IBCs than the wild type strain, which probably accounts for this slight decrease in titers here. But the Loop 2 knockout, again, forms next to no IBCs, so that was really interesting. We were curious if this phenotype is mediated by um, some disruption in type 1 phyllite and a disruption in the bacteria binding to the host cells. However, when we look at phyllite expression, we don't see that it's disrupted. So we can examine phyllite expression by TEM, here's some amino gold TEM for a protein in um, pili. We can also do an amino block for that same protein, and it's similarly expressed across our four strains. And then finally, we can examine the ability of these strains to agglutinate um, guinea pig red blood cells. So type 1 pili are important for this agglutination phenotype. A FMH mutant, which doesn't express type 1 pili, cannot agglutinate red blood cells. The Surya mutant, again, expresses fewer type 1 pili, so it is um, it has inhibited hemoglutination abilities. But all four of the um, strains that I've been examining have very similar levels of hemoglutination. So we don't think that type 1 pili are affected in these strains. To get at this idea of whether binding is um, disrupted across our strains, we started doing some in vitro binding and creation assays. So here are the four strains that I've been, uh, that I've, five strains that I've told you about before. We have our wild type strain, we have our FinH mutant, which can't bind to our cells. The Ombe um, mutant and the Loop 1 mutant both have similar binding to the wild type strain, but the Loop 2 mutant um, is severely inhibited with binding. We are surprised by that. We are curious to follow up on this. So I um, wanted to create a couple of those strains that would help me elucidate what's going on here. And for those two strains, I actually re-derived my Loop 2 knockout just in case there was something goofy going on with this one. And then I also added my loop 2 complementation class into my wild type cell. So then I have a strain that's expressing both full length on bay and then also my loop 2 mutant. And you can see that here in this immuno block when you see the full length and the loop 2 mutant. And then when you put these two strains back into the binding invasion assay, some interesting things happen. So the loop 2 mutant in the on bay background again has limited in binding capabilities, but also in the strain that has wild type as well as mutant on bay you see the same decrease in binding, almost a 50% decrease. So that was pretty exciting. And we also found similar phenotypes in vitro, again, using all of these strains that I'm shared here. So uh, we have our wild type and our thin and our ombre that invade at similar levels. The loop 2 knockouts are severely inhibited, um, both in the ombre background and in the UTI 9 background. And then we also see a little bit of um, inhibition of invasion in the loop 1 knockout, too. Together, this work gives us a few conclusions. We think that if we know that expression of these individual on babies does not affect protein localization, cell viability, overall growth, membrane permeability, a number of different things in our um, UPEC strains. 
We also know that the alpha mutant and that the weak 2 mutant bacteria are attenuated in a urine model of infection. Finally, we were interested to find that bacteria that express this alpha loop 2 mutant, regardless of the background, has impaired binding and invasion. So the major conclusion that we can draw from this is that the extracellular loop 2 of alpha may be functioning to enhance the binding of invasion during infection. And this, there's actually precedent for this um, in the literature. So um, neonatal meningitis causing E. coli and NBC have been shown to bind to the brain microvascular endothelial cells that make up the blood brain barrier. They first do this by associating with the cells via type 1 pili, but then on bay on the surface of these cells can specifically interact with a protein called ECGP96. This allows for CNF1 translocation, and together all of these interactions <coughs> Um, mediate actin re rearrangement and also myosin rearrangement that allows these cells to be taken up and to, for the infection to progress. If we look in the literature, um, it seems like this protein, which goes by a variety of names, ECGP, ECGP96 or HSP90, seems to be expressed in the water urethelium. And also, if I um, do an immunoblot for this protein in uninfected bladder hemorrhages, I think that this protein is also expressed in mice too. So there's a number of downstream experiments that we can do with this. We are interested in examining the expression of ECGP, ECGP96 in both human bladder cells and also murine bladder epithelial cells. And we're interested to quantify both the expression and the localization of this protein before and after exposure to EPEC. Um, in collaboration with Katie Hensler Wildman's lab, um, we had some purified on bay created for us, and so we're able, we are hoping to use this protein for more downstream studies to investigate alternative binding partners that could be either in or on the host uh, epithelial cells. We're also interested to go back and do binding and invasion assays with these gentamicin protection assays within the mouse to see if the phenotypes that we see in vitro um, are recapitulated within the mouse model. And then finally, we're also interested to do some urine infections with the cells that express both the wild type and the mutant on bay to see if the dominant negative phenotype that we've seen in vitro uh, also occurs in vivo. Okay, so um, I'll stop with this. Um, my lab is a great lab to work in. <laughs> I like them very much. I had an um, awesome summer student named India who worked with me last summer. She did some really awesome work. She got a lot done. We actually published a paper um, in a journal for authors that are under 18 called the Journal for Emerging Investigators, so that was really exciting. She got into 10 colleges and got full rides at four. I'm really excited. <laughs> um, a lot of other people have helped with this work along the way. So in the mic microbiology microscopy core, Wandy Beatty has helped with all kinds of stuff, TEM, um, confocal microscopy, and you know, microscopy. Her summer student, or her student, Jeff Elsner, also helped with all the correlation <laughs> studies that I did. Um, some work that I didn't show you here, Jackie Legg, the CID microscopy core, helped me with some SAM. And then um, Eric Tyson at GTAC helped with the analysis of the RNA sequencing. My committee has um, also been really great because I like to show the people's stores unannounced and be like, hey, I want to talk about this. And they're surprisingly open to that. So <laughs> I really appreciate all their input and their willingness to contribute um, their ideas and their time to this project over the years. We've also had a number of different funding sources that have supported this work as well. Okay, so I wasn't really going to skip my lab. <laughs> so um, the lab has changed a lot since I first joined. It was very small. But we got a couple guys. <laughs> um, we grew in size. So um, Patrick, Patrick is the other graduate student in the lab. <laughs> Patrick has this like undying love for science. <laughs> like he gets super excited about everything, which is really awesome when things aren't going well. So he's like, no, it's really awesome. And then when things aren't going well, he's like, no, it's really awesome. You're like, okay, Patrick, like, it's not awesome. <laughs> but I really appreciate his enthusiasm, and he has really awesome ideas. He's always willing to talk to you about what you think could be going on and to toss ideas back and forth. David Rosen is a clinical fellow in our lab. He um, generally is very patient with me with my random <laughs> clinical questions and my questions on Judaism. <laughs> <laughs> For some reason, <laughs> 
<laughs> my interactions with David bring out my like older sibling tendencies, and I really like to push his buttons. <laughs> but um, I really appreciate all of his input with various aspects of projects as well. Julia is one of our newer technicians in the lab. She has shared a bay with me for over a year, which is probably a feat in and of itself. Um, but I appreciate her good nature all of the time. Cindy is our clinical coordinator, and I don't see her very often, but she's always in a good mood and a great to talk to and very supportive as well. Our clinical fellow, Melanie, is here somewhere. Um, had she been in lab more often, I think we could have caused some real trouble. <laughs> she and I both had very similar temperaments, and she's been really awesome and has had a lot of great life advice for me along the way. And then, of course, last but not least, is Kristen, who is one of my really great, great friends. Um, we spent a lot of time together. She lets me uh, watch this guy, and she's like, oh, you're doing me a favor. And really, I'm just hanging out with the dog. <laughs> but uh, Lucy's awesome. Um, and then a previous graduate student in the lab, Meg Lau, who many of you know, was also one of my really great friends. Meg is a fantastic scientist. She's very thoughtful and very thorough. And I learned a lot from having her in the lab, sort of mentoring me and supporting me in my project. Um, <laughs> Meg and I, more often than not, we show up to lab wearing the same thing. <laughs> and Kristen happens too. We don't usually take pictures, but sometimes we're just like, okay, we need one. Um, and then, of course, David is in charge of this whole goofy bunch. <laughs> Sorry, the black, the, the red eye correct makes you look really pretty. We have a serious David, and then we also have uh, Cardinal's gear sporting David at outings. Um, when I first met David, I showed up at his office and knocked on the door, you know, and talked to him about a rotation, and he turned around and said, Oh, I recognize you from the pictures I found online. And so after we talked about I know we talked about it, and then we went back to the lab, I was going to Google myself and said, What is actually out there? <laughs> but um, our talks from there have progressed. And so I don't know how many of you have serious science talks with David, but he has a position in which I think his brain actually functions better. So, <laughs> I tried really hard to get a stealthy picture of him in this position, but I'm not that stealthy, so I had to uh, make do. So David, when he's talking about science, likes to be in this position. I think his brain gets better blood flow or something. <laughs> yeah. um, but David has been an awesome mentor for me over the years. He's been really supportive of me as I come to him with various wacky um, ideas about both science and then also about career development. So. You mentioned that I've been involved in a variety of different other things, and he's also always been very supportive of me pursuing these things and um, spending some time outside of lab to, I think, have a holistic approach to my PhD. And I really appreciated that, and all of the time that he spent with me writing fellowship applications and letters of recommendation, all kinds of other stuff. But he's been a great mentor, and it's been a great experience in his lab. Um, outside of lab, I have some other friends too. <laughs> they are far away, but they're also here. So we do a lot of fun things. We go on adventure bike races, we go sledding, we have a weekly craft night, we have pub crawls, <laughs> we play regular soccer and bubble soccer, and we tailgate for women's soccer games at 9 a.m. when it's 25 degrees out. And then our incoming DDDS class has been a really great group too. Um, there weren't a ton of us, but We've had a lot of fun um, getting together and you know doing some extra good things outside of lab to stay balanced. As David mentioned, I like to play sports. <laughs> um, matching is a theme throughout this talk or throughout this acknowledgement section. So you know we like to match for intramural sports and for kickball. And then the microbiology softball team, out of the last five years, we've won three championships. So we're hoping for a fourth this year. But Fuya has been awesome and our championships result in really awesome pictures like this. <laughs> so we're hoping to relive that this year. I also have a best friend named Janet, who puts up with me for some reason. Um, she's really committed to this friendship. She does her snow barefoot sometimes. Um, she's also committed to uh, really awesome Halloween costumes. I think that's a fashion we both share. And we like each other so much that we've even made our siblings be friends, so <laughs> we're merging our families slowly but surely. And Janet and I, along with another friend of ours, Sarah, often also show up to events totally matching with this kind of thing. In addition to Janet, Ryan has been really supportive over the last few months. Um, 
he's been much more patient with me than I would have been. Um, <laughs> he's not patient with me when we're standing at the top of the mountain and it's dumping snow. He wants to go down the mountain and I want to take pictures. But he's generally very supportive. We do a lot of fun things. We go skiing. We go on putt crawls. We also show up to lab matching occasionally. <laughs> um, and so I appreciate all of his time and support over the past um, while. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then last but not least, my I have to thank my family. So my mom is here. She's the one that looks like me, but like a few years older. Um, we match very well. Um, our family takes matching pictures. Um, so my mom has been very supportive. Cooler heads prevail with her. She has given me a lot of great advice and encouragement over the years. My dad has always encouraged a love for science. At least I think that's what he was doing when he used to bring home snakes as cats and make me take pictures like this. Um, but he has always encouraged my love for science and encouraged me to work hard and to explore um, and to be passionate about discovery. I also have a younger sister who has come to visit me a few times. And um, she also has this undying enthusiasm for things like Patrick. <laughs> which Mike Patrick also drives me nuts sometimes. <laughs> and then we also have some very close family friends, Ted, Susan Hardy, um, that have supported me and sent me uh, packages and you know, been really great um, friends to have. And then last but not least, we also have a highly intelligent lab at home, the age Nike. Okay, and I think that I have drowned out all, all the science, so I'll take any questions that you guys have. <laughs> Questions. I just want to say that the conclusions from the very last part were pub crawls. <laughs> I think you said that your little sister has a passion for things like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's what I thought. I should, we should test that. I promise. Yeah. Okay, question, please. Yeah. Is all baked form dimers or glue rings? Otherwise, it seems to kind of suggest that we have a lot of food and protein to get to eat. Yeah, so that's a really interesting idea. It has been suggested in a few papers, but the majority of papers show that it doesn't. If you examine it in my cells, it doesn't seem to, but some groups have shown that under certain very specific pH conditions that it might be able to actually dimerize and form a much larger core that could actually be large enough to have um, oral on properties. But I haven't looked at that, but that's a great suggestion too, or idea too. I did drown on the science. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so um, there are not a defined set of virulence factors for UPEX. So there's a variety of different genes that are expressed that are thought to aid in infection. You know, type 1 pillar are important. Um, there are some different uh, uh, toxins that might be important in a variety of other genes. There's not actually a defined set. So even though these bacteria are thought to be derived from the gut, um, we're not totally sure what really allows them to thrive in the context of the urinary tract and to you know, utilize potential peptides that are you know, present there. In your in your mutants, your family mutants, you show that they act like screen bacteria physically. Mm -hmm. Do you try to go the same on the floor to get the one out? Yeah, so we haven't ever treated the bacteria with cram before we put them in to see if there are changes in the bacteria that happen. We also haven't tried adding both bacteria and cramp at the same time to see if that affects it. Um, it would be interesting to see if you apply cramp to the bladder before treating, if you can potentially modulate the epithelium in the way that we think could be happening to make it more receptive to infection. Henry? Uh, so, you have a lot of changes in the time you outside when yes. the cramp is going through. So I was wondering if you block inflammation, uh, if you would all still see a defect in the cramp not that fast. Yeah, that's interesting. We haven't um, thought about doing that at all. Um, I'm not sure what would happen. I think we like this idea of cramp as sort of a driver of the immune system and, and more signaling um, roles because it is pretty lowly expressed. Oh, that's a good mention. Um, in the urine, so even though it's upregulated, the concentrations in the urine are anywhere from 100 to 1,000 times lower than the MIC of most of these bacteria. So I really don't think it's antimicrobial. So I think it could be immediately more immediate But we haven't um, thought about specifically blocking. I have tried to compare um, bladders of mice that have similar titers. I don't have a ton of them, but if you compare the cytokine levels in those bladders 
it seems like there's a trend that the plant mice have fewer, have lower levels of cytokine expression. But again, I only have like two and three mice that have really similar titers, so I haven't been able to do that comparison very strong and robustly. Did you examine if, I forget, if cramp blocks adherence in vitro? In vitro. Um, I have not. So I have tried to see if 5637 cells really express L37 and to what level you express that. Um, I haven't ever tried doing binding and invasion assays where I've exogenously treated the cells first um, to see what kind of effects you get there. Questions? Uh, if not, then once again, thank you, Elizabeth. Now, Elizabeth will be getting together with members of her committee, some of whom are here, one of whom is unavailable because he's on the beach, and one of whom is here by Skype to join us, uh, Katie Hensel Rodman from uh, Wisconsin. Hello, Katie. And so um, we'll do that. Um, we all plan to get together, and that goes well, uh, at 4 o'clock. Uh, on the fifth floor of this building in the space that's essentially the equivalent of Max Place on the ninth floor. So I hope to see you down there for doing some peace. Thanks, Thanks everybody for coming. Who is that? 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 Who is that?